Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back. Uh, Nancy Davis in the house. First time. Thank First you time. for uh, thanks. Thanks for making it in person. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the um, the sophistication of Nancy Davis, I think, uh, in written form, and just I mean, your resume fully loaded everything that people may or may not think about you. As soon as they see you in person, it's like, oh wow, she's like, uh, she's real. She can talk. She can uh, articulate this uh, complex situation that we have in the bond market maybe um, or in swaps or whatever you're going to talk about today uh, in English. So I, 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 I look forward to hearing a lot about that. All right, cool. Um, do you want to start with, I guess you said, okay, you want to use a hockey analogy. So the, so the Fed is going to, are we going to actually, are they going to pull the goalie or what do you think is going to happen here? I think they already have. I mean, yeah. who would have thought they would have hiked, you know, 75 in a row, and then we have another 140 basis points priced in but in the next two and a half months of hikes. So yeah. the market is really uh, believing the Fed and thinking they're going to keep going. Do you, do you believe that? I think it's bullshit. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's bullshit. Like on what duration? Because obviously well, the November meeting, people think they're going to do that. 140 basis points is what they need to hike in the next, think about it, two and a half months with midterms, you know, literally around the corner. I think they're going to hike again, but I think, you know, hike and hold is probably going to be more more the playbook. And yep. after midterms, they're going to use their balance sheet more, in my opinion, to, you know, what they're doing isn't working. And all everything, as you pointed out, it's all looking at past stale data. So mm -hmm. they're just killing the economy. Bond market is screaming. Mm -hmm. um, the yield curve is the most inverted it's been since the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually lower than it was in the late 80s, which is pretty wild. The 210 swap curve, I know you and I love to look at that. It's negative 80 right now. Is that the chart that you brought or is it? Yeah, yeah. Guys, can you show that chart so that people know what uh, Nancy's talking about? And maybe uh, explain that, um, swaps versus what they might see on the front month. Just this chart, if you, if you don't mind explaining. Yeah, so basically this is the difference between, you know, the Fed sets a policy rate, which is the overnight overnight rate. Um, so they can hike rates as much as they want, but the bond market does not believe those hikes. The bond market is actually priced for this disinflationary quad four, you know, inflation's transitory environment. You can see that because the twos tens is where lenders lend money, right? Mm -hmm. It's all based on policy rates are irrelevant. It's what all the, you know, every corporate issue or every yep. sovereign issue in the world, when they issue bonds in U.S. dollars, they turn around and hedge their rate risk in the swaps market, kind of like the U.K. They don't, they don't pay for anything. They're not going and buying treasury bonds, right? They're, they're going and using the swaps market. So the swaps market is huge. It's about five times larger than the U.S. stock market. Yep. It's global. And right now, you can get paid 80 basis points less to have a 10-year loan than you do in a two-year loan. So, you know, you basically take more risk, have more duration, and you get paid less for it as a, as a bond investor right now. Mm -hmm. So said another way, you could, why do anything other than just hold T-bills and cash under the mattress, right? It's, Which is exactly what people have done. Yeah, yeah exactly what cash. people are doing. It's another way to say, well, it's a much more sophisticated way to say why, why cash has been the number one position this year, US dollar-based cash. When you execute in that market, because you're you've been doing it your, mm. I guess maybe well your whole professional life at Goldman, were you trading swaps or not? Yeah, I was on the prop desk, so we did everything. Right. I mean, has has there been any unruliness or, you know, plumbing type stuff in that market? Is there anything that's like catching your eye these days, just in terms of daily execution? Yeah, I mean, the bid offers in the treasury markets are growing wider. Volatility yep. in rates has been going higher, unlike equities that have been moving, you know, generally it's not that high. Um, equity vol has really underperformed this year, whereas rate vol is going up. And yes. it makes a lot of sense because the Fed is doing their quantitative tightening. They are, you know, slowly, slowly, slowly unwinding the balance sheet. The mm -hmm. caps just doubled in September. And I expect we're going to see more balance sheet unwind because the Fed hiking policy rates isn't isn't doing it, right? It's not mm -hmm. getting the job done. The data is still, you know, a lot of the data, consumer confidence is at all-time lows. You know, markets are really fearful about what's going to come. And with the yield curve so inverted, they actually have a lot of room to use the balance sheet more and mm -hmm. allow more to roll off or maybe even sell 
uh, some mortgages, which mm -hmm. they've been talking about. Well, it's an interesting uh, point on, you guys can show the move index, that's one, yeah, and it's just like a, a very you know, surface area level of bond vol to show people, but you know, mm -hmm. we show that on the macro show every morning. I mean, I showed it today, it's pinned at the same level that the pandemic you know, mm -hmm. had bond vol. And obviously the VIX is not at 80 or 85, which is equity vol. Uh, yeah. It's more like 30, you couldn't get beyond 35 this morning. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there, subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content. So that, like when you go, when you go back your whole career, I mean, you weren't trading in the 80s, correct? No, no, not that uh, old. I'm, trying to think. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Were I you? Mean, well, I mean, you're, you're like one of these wizards, so you may have been trading as like a 10 year old or something like uh, that. I thanks, know. Keith. I didn't, nice recovery. Yeah, I didn't. Um, but really, for the modern era, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're trading fixed income, you've never really, other than that episodic, what I call episodic and non trending vol uh, spike or cluster of the pandemic, you've never had to deal with this. Well, I think the one thing to keep in mind about the move index is all indices need a listed security. So right. that's using treasury futures, mm -hmm. options on treasury futures, which is not where the big money is in the rates market. The big, it's it's swap in swap the swaps market. market. So the swaps market is actually about the vol that we use inside of IVOL and BNDD is about 35% cheaper than what you see in the move index. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. And, um, and that's because uh, a lot of people just don't, um, don't have access to the OTC markets, the OTC rates markets. Right, can you explain that? I mean, that's a huge advantage, by the way, which I think most people that have invested in IVOL or BNDD, IVOL for sure should know, is that you have a big competitive advantage. I mean, you're in a, well, one of the biggest ponds, it's not a pond, you're in the ocean of swaps <laughs> trading. But most ETFs, certainly ETFs, I don't, is there anybody who trades swaps? Um, swaps are all over the place. But In the ETF constructions? Well, so most fixed income ETFs are using linear derivatives. Right. And the problem with linear derivatives is you make a dollar, lose a dollar, and you can have a funding risk at any time. That's kind of like what happened exactly. with the UK, right? With us, we use fully funded long only options. So it gives us a lot of staying power to weather kind of the volatility the curve moved from you know, positive 75 at the beginning of this year to negative 80 right now. Think about that. That's you know, just insane the amount of move. <laughs> and as of yesterday, IVOL was about the same as tips, and that's because we've been making money on vol, even though the curve is so massively inverted now. So there's kind of, I think, a neat, a lot of different ways to win, and I think owning fixed income vol is super important for investors because most people are only short fixed income vol because of their allocation to Perfect. things like the ag yeah. or TLT. any place you got mortgages. Beware, mortgages, homeowners are along the option to prepay, so owners of those mortgages are short fixed income volatility. So I feel yep. like equity vol gets all the attention um, with old Wall Street, to use yeah. your terminology. But I think the thing that really people should be aware of is their fixed income vol that's kind of embedded inside of these single QCIP products. And that's why we created our funds to give a positive convexity uh, profile right. instead of just being short fixed income vol. I mean, pie chart central, everybody's short 60, 40, whoever's long TLT. Yeah. You know, there's so much pain in these positions. Yes. And if they could understand that public enemy number one to your position is a breakout in volatility, that would be a good start. And um, I guess on that, like you know, most people are like, how do, you, how do you make it go away? Well, the Fed makes it go away, you know, or it perpetuates it. Currently it's perpetuating it. So just allowing for this debate or pivot, 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 and there's no pivot, and whatever the market's trading on today in short windows of time is almost like the Fed the Fed's perpetuating it through their inability to, people's expectation that they're wrong. It's interesting, because so they're gonna stay steadfast with the wrong forecast, and the market's saying the forecast is 100% a, is a wrong. So the two collide, mm -hmm. and eventually you're trying to get the Fed to where the market believes you know, the economy is gonna be, in the case of recession, inverted mm -hmm. curve, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think about, like is that, is this, are we in like the walliest of Wally worlds? I mean, I've been critical of the Fed for a long, long time, but 
I don't think you could be this critical about their 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 steadfast forecast hmm. coming out of one that put us in the position that we're in today. I mean, transitory inflation to today. We're going to land the plane softly. We're not worried about a recession. What do you think about that? No, I, I think the market is very complacent that the Fed has got this under control. And I don't understand that at all. I don't see why people would believe the Fed. Um, you know, it's amazing to me that even with the CPI report coming out, you know, in the eight handle, like even if it was a little bit lower than last print, it's still in eights. But the, the break even level, just using inflation protected bonds, it's just barely above 2%. On oh, no, like a five year, though. Even the two year, the, the yeah, two year, two year is yeah. so. So the market is really priced for for what you've been calling that inflation has peaked and that future inflation is really cheap. But that's yeah. where I think there's kind of an opportunity out there because you always want to everything you want to buy low, sell high, and future inflation expectations are not expensive. They're very low, and I think a lot of people have been rocked in their sixty forty portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing to keep in mind is a ag index or core fixed income has no inflation protection in it. Zero. Zero. And that's because, you know, these indices are old and the inflation protected bond market, it didn't even start to the late 90s. And I so I think a lot of people look at what happened in the 70s and what do we do and have commodities or equities or, you know, cyclical equities or real estate. And I think it's just a different time now that investors really should be building up because confidence in the Fed is super high and I think it should be super low. And you don't see that. The term premium of interest rates is negative. You mm -hmm. know, the market, I guess we're, the U.S. is like so much better than everywhere else. Everywhere right. else is such a mess. It's kind of like, for some reason, well, it's people like, are coming here. Like their confidence is, their confidence is, is so short term though. Like the market's confidence is based like on the, on the short end of the curve is that Oh, we're very confident that you're confident that you're going to do the 75 and then the 50 and maybe a 25. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's not going out two years. That's going out two months. Yeah, yeah. Two days, two weeks, two months. You know, two years break evens, five year break evens, further out in time, and the more obvious it obviously becomes. But it's not really, from an like from my perspective, that's like a couple careers from now. I mean, go, <laughs> go, go a couple, go two years from now. Yeah. I mean, we're going to have traversed four quad fours in a row. We're going to already be on the other side and into a recession. So, like, is that what you mean that you can't believe that the market is that confident in the short term? I mean, in, in the long term, the market, the market is, you know, the stock market's telling you, the, the bond market's telling you, the currency market's telling you that in a year from now or two years from now, they don't believe the Fed at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the thing the Fed can't control is the labor market. And the thing that really worries me is a lot of the states right now mm -hmm. are giving inflation relief by giving checks to people. And that, you know, if you think about it, that could actually cause more labor problem issues. And the Fed hiking policy rates isn't going to fix the shortage that we have globally of workers and the shortage in the right. labor market. It's also not going to fix the supply side disruptions around the world. And that's why I think investors really, you know, I know we're in quad four right now, but I just don't think, especially as you get closer to retirement, I think you should have inflation protection in your portfolio because future inflation expectations are so low, it's really cheaply priced. Right, that's interesting. Another way to you know, take that question and go the other way with it is is just that. This is the macro show, this is pre-game, okay? We're trying to play the game that's in front of us today, I'm trying to give you all the content so that you can see that there are many tools in the toolbox to play at the highest level. You know, leadership matters at Hedgeye, so again, being transparent, accountable, and trustworthy people. This is a game about playing and weighing probability. It's not about picking stocks, it's about picking the right portfolio. Execute across everything. Don't get distracted by the MSM and the tourists. They're very dangerous. I will grind and execute for you, with our people and with you. If and when the Fed does pivot or they're done, which is now on the calendar, like you said. Yeah. You know, once we're through the December hike, are they really gonna do February 25 basis points? Who cares? Yeah. You know, and you have some bombs in jobs reports. Yeah. You know, that's gonna reflate inflation because we're gonna have a dollar down reflation that way. It's interesting that we have this kind of you know, inflation cyclically with a, with with one of the stronger yeah. the strongest dollars in world history. The proper, you know, kind of commodity market inflation was Ben Bernanke, dovish, 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 inverting the curve in 2011. 
uh, I believe that's one, yeah, gold and the CRV index hit its all time high. Mm -hmm. So you could be invested in inflation by owning commodities and owning gold in that case. Um, is that is that where it's mispriced on a two to five year basis that the Fed ultimately has to devalue the dollar, turn tail dovish, and take inflation from wherever it slows to, to going back up again? I think a lot of people look at the commodity markets for inflation because that's what existed the last time we had super high inflation. I think a very simple way to look at it is using the interest rate and inflation markets. Mm, but I okay. think a lot of people don't look there no, of course because not. it didn't exist in the 70s. So everything is so backward looking and what happened last time. I think just keep it simple. Stick with inflation markets or the yield curve, interest rate differentials. I mean, they're trading literally below where they were in the 80s. And it's so, you know, it's so cool because you can get that risk on or risk off, either the Fed can't hike 140 basis points before the end of the year because maybe something happens in Europe or something happens geopolitically or mm -hmm. or they back off ahead of midterms, like who knows? But there's 140s priced in, so either lower front-dated yield expectations or higher long-term yields. Either yep. way, I think you kind of, you can get that risk on, risk off. And I think that's why I really love Ival so much because you can have that you don't have to make a one-way view that credit spreads are going to tighten and yields go lower, which is right. what you know 99% of the world has in their bond portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, so oh, that's interesting. The the on Ival, like the product, what is the most common question that you get that annoys you? Um, I think the most common question that I get that annoys me is inflation is raging, why is it not performing? And I'm like, it's got inflation in the name, but it is also doing other things. We we benefit from less Fed it's hike got expectations. It's in the name. Yeah, it's like, it's like, that's part of the name, but there are also five other words there. You know, we're making money off of rate volatility this year. Right. Tips have gone down because inflation has fallen, expectations, because the market's saying, oh, the Fed's hiking, we're not going to have inflation. And that's why it's so cheap to own it. Mm -hmm. You know, you always want to be like against the grain. Like right now, everybody, you've convinced the world. Everybody thinks we're quad four. The market is priced for quad yep. four. And so that's why I think it's cheap to own these inflation expectations in the future because everybody thinks, oh, the Fed is going to overhike. Oh, there's going to be a recession. The markets are super bearish. Consensus is very bearish. And I think having that, that asymmetry to say, look, either the Fed won't hike as much, or long-dated yields are going to go higher, or the Fed's not going to be successful in taming inflation. I think it's really cheaply priced. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's super cheap if if you believe that the Fed gets on board, if you believe that Ival will do well when the curve steepens again. I mean, that's but, another way, that's an, uh, also a, a scenario that is quad four, right? Mm -hmm. A pure quad four is not what we have right now. Yeah. Right now, like a typical quad four, if you guys show slide eight, you would have the top three asset classes would be U.S. dollars, duration, and gold. Mm -hmm. um, currently, two-thirds of that doesn't work because you have real rates rising. But in a proper quad four, where, when you're heading into a, or you are in a recession, the long, you know, the, sh the long end is, 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 is falling and the Fed is cutting. So you get, and as you well know, mm -hmm. as you're entering a recession, the curve steepens. Yeah. I mean, so to me, like when I look at Ival, I'm like signal based. But is that the wrong assumption to say that if I'm betting at some point, because I've not been, I've been of a, you know, I've been looking for an inverted deal curve for a long time, so I'm staunchly in that position. It's kind of stale, right? Mm -hmm. What's my risk range on tens, twos if I look at the front end of it? It's like minus 30, minus 60 basis points unless I'm trying to make a call, which I don't do, that we're gonna have the lowest or the most inverted curve in human history for a protracted period of time, you know, what's left? Yeah. What's next is short end comes down because the Fed's taking it out and we get a steepening. Yeah, it's a great, it's a very common uh, risk off trade for, for hedge funds is to have the steepener on. We do it with option format and I think that is a great, if you think about why do people have bonds in their portfolios, they're there for monthly income. We pay out a minimum of 30 basis points every month. We can do Which well when equities sell off because the market will price in lower 
front dated yields or even less hikes or potentially even cuts because we have yep. we hiked super quick. And so it's a great equity risk off trade, which mm -hmm. um, hasn't worked so far this year, but that's because the Fed is just like super, super hawkish with but their it, forward in, in guidance. 20, when was the first time I, you'd probably remember when I bought Ivol? Um, you bought it just it was right. 24, it, was coming, it was coming out of 2018 maybe or into yeah. the quad I, four of 2018. And that's when you had equities straight down 20%. Ivol would go up every day. Yeah, if you look at 2020 to the first quarter of 2021, we were up Simple. about 18% yeah. when tips by themselves, which is 85% of the for portfolio, was up nine. So we had double the performance. Yeah, that was, that was the period. And we made money in March 2020 yeah. when tips by themselves lost money. So I, I want to grab people and be like, this is a great defensive, you know, it has nothing to do with equities, but it can do well in a you know, risk off environment. And right. I think especially as we go into the end of the year, it's it's things have gotten worse in Europe. You know, the situation with Russia has really escalated. Mm -hmm. The UK is a disaster. The Fed has got to be worried about financial stability at this point. And I think Lael Brainerd, my fellow blonde, um, <laughs> <laughs> on Monday on uh, this, uh, I don't know what to call Monday, whatever holiday it was, whatever the PC name for it is now, but the bond market was closed, but she gave a speech that I thought was pretty, pretty um, dovish. You mm -hmm. know, like she's always been a dove, but she was talking about geopolitical risk, liquidity crisis. Yep. Like the Fed, I hope, is not stupid. I don't think they're stupid. I mean, they've been pretty stupid so far, to your point. But I feel like at some, at some point, with 140 basis points. Of hikes, think about it, it's two and a half months, right? We're in the mid October, two and a half months, they have to hike 140 just to not steepen the curve. And I think that's asymmetric. You know, I think it's in a in a good way symmetry. Well it's 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 like quite literally like asymmetry defined where you had to beat it over the head multiple times every month for nine months and eventually nobody cares right when you should start to care. Yeah. That's the you know, definition of asymmetry is that most people just don't care. They don't have the position on. If anything, like you know, people like keep trying to pick bottoms in the economy or pick bottoms in the stock market. But in the bond market, mm. to me, the bond market and gold. Right now, it's kind of the same thing. Duration and gold, their real rates, it's trading the same. Um, there's a much bigger opportunity on the long side in duration or gold than buying friggin' Qs <laughs> or profitless tech. I mean, yeah. but that's the They're way down about the same, right? <laughs> right, they're down about the same, but one is coming out of a raging, like mother of all bubble highs. Yeah. And the other, like gold's last rager was back in 2011. Yeah. A long time ago. Yeah. You know, so you don't do gold, do you? Or do you own gold? I really like owning gold in negative yielding currencies. I think that is like the sexy way. Because the problem with gold is it has no <laughs> sexy way. Wait, wait, You don't put that in your portfolio, so right? Like you, yeah. In your PA? Um, so in IVOL and BNDD are rates, but right. quadratic is, you know, kind of all asset classes, all with that positive convexity. And yep. so we really like owning gold in other currencies other than the dollar. Right. So you can get that negative yielding carry to help help give you positive carry. I kind of, I guess I'm a big uh, carry whore, for lack of a better term. <laughs> well, those have been great. I mean, yeah. if you're long, you know, I mean, pick pick the currency. Yeah. And we're not even, like it used to be that, you know, getting really sexy is buying like gold and Sri Lankan rupee. <laughs> now that's out there, you know. Yeah, that's but, out there. But now you can do it in pounds. Yeah. And yeah. that's, pounds, really? Yeah. These people are going to behave this way? Or Swiss franc. Oh, Swiss franc. Yeah, it's amazing. Did you see this morning, these guys? The, the, cha the Chancellor of the Exchequer, you know, this guy, <laughs> Quartang, or whatever his name is. I can't say it. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a terrible like, name. Like, all of it. Like, yeah, it's like, the whole thing. I have to remember all that um, to make the point. It tells the, the, the British press that the Bank of England guy, Bailey's on his own. And if this blows up, it's on him. Yeah. Like, not my problem. <laughs> right. A G7, like, yeah. of all the major central banks in all the history, I can't, can you remember a time where the, the equivalent of Janet Yellen says, if this economy keeps blowing up in markets, it's on Powell? Can, yeah. can you, can you re recall any, any major central bank doing it this way? Yeah, Would that's the, not the, the teamwork that we, uh, we should have for <laughs> economies. It's, I mean, I think, 
you know, there's definitely a lot of trouble brewing in the bond markets, right? LDI, yeah. every single pension fund, every single insurance company, they're all receiving rates and they're just getting hammered right now. And that's a problem with linear derivatives, right? That's the reason I love our funds so much because we have these like safe hands. We can hold on to the options. Even when it's not working, we can hold on to them. Mm -hmm. We have probably five different options that are literally marked every day in Ival, and they're marked close to zero. And so if you buy the fund, you still get all those little worthless options and they're all just sitting there and they can just like, they're little, you know, explosive bombs because a lot of them are short dated so they can, in a good way, yeah, in a good way really have up. that positive convexity. So I think it's, um, it's really a tough time for linear derivatives in this market because there's so much volatility. And I think that's why the way that we express these positively convex portfolios makes so much sense. Because it gives us it gives us staying power. You know, the average weighted tenor within the eyeball portfolio is about 21 months in terms of where the premium Ooh. is. So it's really, really long dated. Yeah, long we day. have a lot of time to kind of sit and wait. And the yield curve is the most inverted it's ever been. It's even lower than it was in the 80s in the swap space. It's below the low back then. Mm -hmm. So being negative 80, it's pretty cheap. You know, there are not many not many things in financial markets today that you can buy that are trading at you know valuations from the 1980s in with the asymmetric profile and then the vol 35 percent discount to the move index i think yeah, it's pretty good, good too I, mean, I think if it was in equity space people would understand that you know, <laughs> the asymmetry and the yeah. the actual value now that's value because we've already had the rate hike cycle and it's yeah. like you said if it's 140 basis points 120 160 it doesn't matter yeah at this point it's there um before I take other people's questions, can you explain the difference between IVOL and TIP or TIPS generally? Well, I think the big problem with TIPS, and I know you and I agree on this, is that they're bonds, so they're all long duration. So yep. the problem with TIPS is if you actually have inflation move higher, especially with the Fed not doing QE, the rest of the world is basically going to be buying our debt. And so as inflation moves higher, you would expect higher long-term yields because of more term premium. IVOL actually has a way to benefit from that mm -hmm. versus most people when they're worried about interest rates, they just own short duration bonds. But right. it's it's like a fake name, right? It's not, yeah. it's not short anything. It's just really less long duration. So it still is guaranteed to lose money. Whereas a we have a, prof, a way to profit from higher long-term yields or lower front term yields. And then the other problem with TIPS by themselves, whether it's SCHP or TIP, is the only index, like think about it, it's, it's an index, is the CPI, which came out this morning, right? Mm -hmm. Consumer price index, and a third of it's rent. Mm -hmm. So it's just not the only way to measure something as big as inflation. Like nobody would ever buy, I don't know, the NASDAQ or the Dow Jones and say, ta-da, I have you know, the U.S. equity market, why would you ever do that with something as big and as hard to measure as inflation? And mm -hmm. that's why I think using rate differentials, like where lenders lend money, yep. is a very simple way to say, this is inflation expectations outside of CPI. It's simple, but it's sophisticated re relative to the norm. You know, it's kind of like me and the old wall, or you know, don't mm. use a 50-day moving monkey. <laughs> it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. the, the history of tips is interesting. I mean, Ray Dalio basically created the tips market. Yeah. And I guess he's, he's stepping aside now. Um, but he just went to Summers one day and said, hey, look, you know, isn't that a great thing? You create something and get everybody to buy it. You know? Yeah. It's, um, to me... Like if I really just kind of take face value what he's what he wrote in his book, or just kind of mm -hmm. like how he, yeah, I don't think he talks about this enough, but not that it matters. But to me, it was like a it was a security, like a plug, mm -hmm. that when duration is going to underperform or get smoked, you just buy the thing. It's like it's like you and your friend in the bush, and, and there's a bear. You just got to outrun your friend. You know. So the tip, tip to me was just a. It's always sucked as an absolute return thing, <laughs> right? Um, and it's something that I just rarely own because there's always better alternatives, including eyeball. Thank you. Um, but it's really not what it's sold to be. 
Yeah, I, don't, I think a lot of people don't realize that because we haven't really had runaway inflation since the 70s, except for this like period right now. And the market is so complacent that the Fed hiking rates, it's going to kill inflation. But it's really cheaply priced. Um, and I think the other interesting thing is inflation is not just a U.S. thing. It's global. Yeah. There's inflation everywhere, but the U.S. is one of the cheapest markets in the world, whether you're looking at the five-year, five-year, the break-even market. The yield curve in the U.S. is the most inverted globally out of pretty much every market yeah. out there. It's just outstanding. And, and we love to spend money. You know, the, the states are giving people money as inflation relief. Like, I think it's really the time back up the truck because I don't know when it's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But when it does, it's... The ball tends to go up too as the curve steepens, so it's like a really nice positive correlation that you can get with steeper curve, higher interest rate volatility at the same time. On this, do you get? Um, I'll get to other people's questions now, but the um, do you get? How many pension funds or big allocators have this discussion with you on tips versus eyeball? A lot of, I mean, there's these things aren't inconsequential in terms of their size. Well, it's interesting because in the United States, most pension funds are benchmarked to core fixed income, which is the ag. And so they don't actually have linkers inside the ag. The ag has no inflation protected bonds. Oh, there's zero. nothing in there? None. Oh, okay. It's 45% nominal treasuries. About a third of it is short volatility from mortgages. And then the other, call it 30%, is stuff with credit spread risk, you know, which is the same beta as equities, right? If you're going to have corporate beta, you might as well. Yeah. You know, credit's so expensive, in my opinion, because credit spreads haven't really widened. It's all been duration that has hurt bond performance this year. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's interesting because with a lot of the U.S. pension funds, they're not looking for inflation protection. They're not looking for tips because it creates benchmarking risk, which I think is why the U.S. market is so cheap for inflation expectations mm -hmm. relative to other markets, whereas like the U.K., their pension funds, are, they all have to own inflation-protected bonds. So the U.S. market is actually cheaper than other markets globally hmm. for it's inflation. A, it's, 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 I guess that's why people dogpiled into commodities right at the top. Yeah. Because I mean, they're like, there really was no way. And there was an incredibly low asset allocation at the pension fund level yeah. to commodities as an asset class. So yeah. voila, we get it. And you get oil 123. And it's the new year, and these yeah. poor pensions are allocating, you know, allocating the commodities right at the top. It's, yeah. it's nuts. No, it is <laughs> nuts. And I think it's because they, they look at what happened in the past, and just see, you got to keep in mind, inflation protection is a new thing. It only started in the late 90s. The interest rate derivatives markets weren't really you know, trading actively in vol space until the 2000s. So it's like... Right. When did well, you start trading it? Um, I started at Goldman in, uh, in the late 90s. Late 90s? Yeah, 98. Yeah, so that was pretty typical of Goldman. It's like, okay, new market. You know, this is where we want to trade some prop. Yeah. New markets are the best markets to trade. Yeah. You know, was it, when you look back at that time, is it, was, was that one of the most, well, I mean, clearly it had to be a formative moment in your career, but did you, did you think that it would all happen that fast? You know, I think I was very fortunate to be in the prop group. Um, you know, I uh, I joined the prop desk in the 2000s, so around 2000, 2001. Yeah, when um, people are all tech investors. Yeah, yeah, it was a crazy time. <laughs> and uh, it was a great environment because we had all the systems from the south side, so we knew where all, you know, if we wanted to look at the ABX market or if we wanted to look at, you know, oil options or if we wanted to look at, you know, yeah. Hong Kong dollar rate swaptions, you know, we had access to everything. And yeah. so it was a really cool, cool training ground. I feel very grateful that I was there. And I got promoted to to be the head of credit derivatives and OTC trading. I was like 24 years old. <laughs> I, mean, I love like, that story. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it's mean, cool. That's why, like, I, I think of your career, like, you've been, this is not your first rodeo. I mean, you've been doing, like, being the boss for almost 20 years. Well, I've been running my own firm for about 10 years, yeah. so... Um, I mean, like, you know, head of a desk, it's a big big job. Yeah. But yeah. 20... It's, it's, that's Wall Street. It's, it's mm. who learned first. Yeah. Who's on the switch. Generally speaking, I, I don't care how old somebody is on our team. You know, yeah. it's like, if you figure it out first, you do it. Yeah, I mean, I think trading and portfolio management is the ultimate meritocracy, where you have 
a number next to your name. You know, you don't have to, it's not <laughs> who do you play golf with or who do you hang with? You know, it's, it's do you make money or do you not? And on the prop desk, if you don't, You're you out get of canned. Yeah, they don't say, yeah. well, he's from Thunder Bay. He's the <laughs> chancellor of Thunder Bay. Like, let's, right. let's make sure he's the head of, um, you know, Twitter. Uh, it's like crazy, like what people assign to valuable opinion in this market. I don't want to go off on that. Let's just, um, actually, here, first question has to say, in your opinion. Uh, this question is from Alex. Uh, in your opinion, which is more likely uh, the next big issue in fixed income? So sovereigns forcing to sell their U.S. treasuries to prop up their own private markets, companies unable to roll over their debt, or uh, or the signs of illiquidity in the recent treasury action yesterday? It's a lot. I mean, A, B, and C probably. <laughs> like I could see them all happening. Really? Um, yeah. You, I mean, even the first one. You think, yeah, well, you, you, you think for, uh, sovereigns are going to blow out of their treasuries? Well, the, the well, problem is sovereigns. is that with LDI management, they all are receiving rates, right? So when they get margin calls, which can happen at any point, whether it's futures versus exchange or whether it's OTC market with swaps versus a dealer, as interest rates move higher, they can get more and more margin calls. And what do they do? They have to sell treasuries yeah. to post collateral. So it's already it's, happening. It's happening, yeah. I mean, I think I'm surprised that the U.S. hasn't really seen any kind of waves after the U.K., but it's a it's a major issue. And that's a problem. Like, linear derivatives are all over the place mm -hmm. in institutional portfolios. And I'm not a big fan. I know that sounds weird because I, I love positive convexity, you know, using options, not linear derivatives like futures forward swaps because that's like, it's almost like credit card exposure where you get you buy something that but you don't really pay for it and then you only make a dollar and you can also lose a dollar in a symmetric way whereas optionality you have that positive yeah. convexity which is what i love i mean the, con uh, the there's still a significant amount of convexity in high yield i mean to your point you know well spreads have widened they just haven't widened to their wides yeah and that's something that that looks increasingly interesting um that that was companies unable to roll over the de their debt. That was that component of that question. I mean, we've really not had, go back your career. I mean, when's the last time we had um, a high yield crisis? 2016 I mean, or? Yeah, it's been a while. And I think the, the problem is, is that a lot of corporates have been, you know, issuing more and more debt to buy back their equities. So it's kind of been this washing machine. There's a lot more corporate debt than there was during yep. the last financial crisis. And so I think the debt servicing needs, and a lot of people, you gotta be really careful with short duration, because if you own short duration, especially with credit risk, that just means the lender has uh, less time to pay back the loan, right? right? And that's where you, credit curves are just like ball curves. They, they invert, right? So the short dated becomes wider than the longer dated because you have less time to pay back your loan. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's super important for short duration. That's why I like Ival instead of that because we actually have a way to profit when long dated yields go higher rather than losing less money and we don't take credit spread risk, we take interest rate spread risk, right? right. It's just something different. Well the credit risk component, I mean a lot of institutions by the way at the beginning of the year were crowding into shorter maturity corporates. Mm -hmm. And that, that's no bueno if, if we're right on four straight quad fours because you're going to have credit risk as far as the eye can see. Yeah. And that's another thing. Like, is this Fed really going to change their tune on that and come bail out the, the you know, high yield market? I don't know. It's maybe, maybe that's what they said intraday. I, I doubt it. But uh, I'd be surprised. I guess nothing should surprise me for the rest <laughs> of my career because we've seen a lot, Nancy. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, this question's, I think we've covered it. Um, Keith from David. Keith, can you ask uh, Nancy how she would buy, quote unquote, low future inflation expectations that she says are really cheap in real terms, what to buy, what duration? Thanks. So um, the break even curve is downward sloping. So the further you go out, the cheaper it is. Um, with IVAL, we use the Bloomberg Tips Index, so it's just a passive index. Um, I think it's pretty decent because you have a lot of liquidity there as well. The reason that we use the passive index is just to be very tax efficient. So we haven't had capital gains tax because we use the other ETF to buy our treasuries because treasuries are a 
you know, capital asset and they generate capital gains. And then we use the options to capture inflation expectations okay. outside of CPI. And with the yield curve in swap space, negative 80 is the twos tens right now. It's pretty cheap. So I, I like owning eyeball. I think it's, it's highly asymmetric, especially if the Fed can't deliver that 140 basis points of hikes until the end of the year. It's two and a half months, right? That's yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's like yeah. 75 and almost a, a whole nother 75. Yeah, on that, like the um, tax efficiency is a very good point in terms of the product. Uh, what about the payout? Like that's, that to me, that that was always one of the best when yeah. I was long it. And, and you're talking me into getting long it. Um, <laughs> it's one, it, it's like, it's like one of the best parts of the product. Is, what is the asymmetry in that ratio relative to what it's been? Is there is there a lot of upside somehow, or is it just always going to be in and around what it's been? No, we I really like the options keep. So we are to our skis with you know as much options as we can <laughs> have. Yeah, yeah, we are we are, we are, we are jumping. <laughs> we are like full blown. Um, we have more options than we've had, and a lot of them. They get marked every day, so a lot of them are actually priced at zero. So if you buy the portfolio now, you just get a basically a portfolio with a lot of worthless options because we're long only, so we don't, unlike linear derivatives, we don't have to sell them. We just buy them and we hold on to them because we it's a long-term asset yeah. allocation trade. And then just a little bit of steepening, I mean, the thing can move. It can really move. And rate vol, I think, is just a great thing to own with quantitative tightening. But would it move the distribution? Or the yeah, because we have so many options in the portfolio, our sensitivity to a one basis point change in the yield curve is about four cents on the funds nav. So one bit, four cents. So yeah, it can- Shit. Yeah, it's, shit is right. It's, it's, got a lot of options in there. <laughs> Have you modeled it out? Like, what is the max distribution? Do you call it a distribution, by the way? I think monthly um, payout distribution. Yeah, we pay 30 basis points monthly yeah. minimum for the past three plus years. But when the options make a lot of money and we sell them, they're actually taxed as ordinary assets uh, okay. because it's not the treasury curve, it's a swap curve. So it's kind of annoying because it's harder to see for people, but we have this really unique tax treatment. So we paid out 50 basis points in December 2019. We paid out 47 basis points in December 21. So as the options make money and we profit take, okay. that generates negative ordinary income. But here's the other cool thing. We have a lot of options that are priced at zero. Yep. As they expire, they generate negative, negative. ordinary income. Yeah. So you can actually get your tips yield, your tips interest income, but not pay as much income taxes potentially because you can have the options that generate the negative ordinary income. Hmm. So it's kind of kind of cool. Did you think of that like in in terms of its original construction, or did you yeah. as you? You did, in a, so you didn't just see it develop as, as you transacted? No, no, we, I saw the ETF wrapper as a technology, as a, you know, as a total return investor. You know, it'd be a lot easier for us, for instance, to just use the treasuries directly, just buy them directly. Why do we use ETFs inside is to take advantage of that tax efficiency. Yep. It's using the structure as a as a technology so it was very very intentional hmm, awesome yeah so it's that's not like me like everything at hedge eye it's like kind of make it up as i go along right? <laughs> it's like uh it i i, I do well i had been running the firm for <laughs> seven years before we we created eyeball so that's uh it's yeah. i mean but but you see my point i mean in a lot of trades in a lot of markets you, you just it the position becomes itself you mm -hmm. know because the market structure whatever is changing and I thought maybe that's what happened here, but no, you actually thought about that yeah. well ahead of time. Well done, Nancy Thank Davis. You. Well done. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here's an interesting question uh, from Brian Sells. Eyeball and BNDD have low weekly correlations to the AG, AGG, yet similar performance this year. Got any thoughts on that? Well, I don't know if that's all true, by the way. I, that's the problem with some questions on the macro show. Like a third of the question could be <laughs> false, um, but take it however you want. I mean, people will look at obviously the performance of those three things. Yeah, I mean, BNDD has had tremendous outperformance versus the Vanguard Treasuries. Because that that's own. its perform. Yeah, they're yeah, different. The, they're a different bench. Different. So that's more of like 
for a treasury replacement, you know, instead of owning long-dated treasuries that are going to make a dollar, lose a dollar, BNDD has that bond convexity. I think it's a great solution, actually, for LDI investors around the world. Look at that fund, mm -hmm. <laughs> because you can, you know, if the Fed continues to hikes and the yield curve continues to invert, that's going to have an asymmetric payout for, you know, if we do have deflation, if we do become Japan, whereas Ival, you know, it's long only options. So as of yesterday, we were about flat year to date with tips. We didn't really, vol's gone higher. The curve went from positive 75 to negative 80 today. Like think about that move in the last 10 and a half months. It's just been one of the biggest flattenings we've ever had in the history of financial markets. Mm -hmm. And the fund's flat to tips mm -hmm. as of yesterday. That's flat on, on year to price date. or does it include the Total return, yeah, total, yeah, return, total yeah. return. Okay. Flat on the total so return. So with is this accurate that Ival and BNDD have similar performance to, to AGG this year? Well, AGG is down uh, more than Ival is down. So okay. we're, you know, AGG, nothing nothing in Ival are, is in AGG. So we tend to have very, very low correlations because <laughs> it's, it's like not the same. They're two totally different things. Totally but different <laughs> things. It's just AGG is down a little bit more than Ival is, but it's got different stuff in it, which is why it's so non-correlated. Like a lot of um, a lot of your RAAs use IVOL as a completion portfolio to the AGG because nothing in IVOL is in the AGG. The AGG is only short volatility because a third of its mortgages, and it has no inflation protection bonds at all. Mm. So a lot of people just say whatever. If we have a hundred dollars in AGG, we'll take a third of that and buy IVOL to have a more diversified core fixed income portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's a, yeah. well, that in and of itself. Why don't, why didn't you create these brain dead ones, by the way? Like your stuff, <laughs> your stuff's like sophisticated, complex options. Why don't you just launch the computer, like the computing product to AGG or TLT? This is brain dead stuff. This is easy. <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess I'm I'm such a, you know, I want to better people's outcomes. Like I think I'd rather do something that's really different and something I really believe yeah. in that's value add. I mean, at the end of the day, your reputation is the only thing that you have in life. Right. And, you know, yeah, it'd probably be easier to raise money if we just did what everybody else did. Like why am I making it so <laughs> difficult for myself? But I I feel good about it. You know, I like yeah. I feel like, you know, why not Investors in fixed income have only had short volatility exposure until our ETFs came along outside of you know, the institutional world, because you can't trade the OTC volatility markets without ISDA agreements. And so giving access and creating that single QCIP product, I just thought was a really good thing for investors, a good thing to do. And, and it's nice because there's no funding obligation, right? We fully pay for the options. So it gives us a lot of staying power to kind of weather, you know, as a long-term inflation play, inflation can go massively negative, right? Mm -hmm. There's no zero bound. So using fully funded options, I just think is a, is a better way to no, do it than using it's, it's tips. A, and, and hopefully that didn't offend you asking that. It's like, it's like when somebody asks me, like, why don't you just go start a hedge fund? I'm like, eh. <laughs> it's like, you know, been there, done that, first of all. But more importantly, I just don't, like, this is this is the path for it. The obstacle is the path, as, mm -hmm. as, as Ryan Holiday wrote. And I, I, I think that there's so many different ways that you and I agree on that, like mm -hmm. innovation, evolving the business, you know, aligning our products with our, you know, with who we are. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we want to help people at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, you want to better client outcomes and doing what, you know, old Wall Street, as you like to say, they all do the exact same thing. You know, 99% of bond portfolios look exactly like the ag, <laughs> plus or minus 25 basis points. And I think that's, that's unfortunate. And you want to be able, especially, like, think about if you're retired, right? If you're retired, you're not going to benefit from wage inflation, right? You're just going to have a higher cost of living. So I think people, you know, generally everybody should own inflation protection in their portfolio because we can't trust the Fed. The Fed doesn't know what they're doing. You know, they've been so <laughs> wrong about everything. And future inflation expectations are super cheap. Mm -hmm. It's really cheap, even though realized inflation is so high. So that's been kind of the most frustrating thing is trying to educate people that 
look, I know realized inflation is really high, but the market believes that the Fed hiking rates is going to kill inflation. It's priced in. The yield curve's negative 80 right now in the 210 swaps curve. Um, the yeah. tips market is 2.4 percent. You know, it's just barely above the 2 percent symmetric target. And so I think it's a great time to have that that inflation asymmetry rather mm. than messing around and you know your grandmother's inflation, which is the commodity <laughs> market. Well, you're not you're not people's grandmother, no. uh, not and yet. I'm not their grandpa <laughs> yet. But the, uh, what I, I think when you Hope go to be though one day, <laughs> you go like this. This is Nancy Davis when she Woo! talks about when she talks about the product. It's like this. It's awesome. It's uh, I'm trying to get people to call me Sunshine now. So Sunshine <laughs> with a heart. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's how. Again, thank you for educating everyone. Absolutely. And thank you for spending time with us. Thanks for having me on, Keith. It's great to see you. Great to be here. It's cool. It's it's great to see everybody here. And up next, I will have the one and only Daniel DiMartino Booth. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation. Or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there. Subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content.